Breaking news coming to you tonight from the Wednesday Night Light Studio. April Fool's Day postponed. Due to uncertain times surrounding the coronavirus, the officials are now eyeing an October 1st makeup. Welcome, Bridge Builders, to Wednesday Night Lights for another installment of Wednesday Night Lights. And that meme was actually brought to you by my roommate from college and dear friend, Luke Smith. I got a good chuckle out of it, so I thought I'd share it with you. Thank you for blessing us with that, Luke. Well, we're doing a standalone message today. What a standalone message is, is it's a message that kind of fills some space before we jump into our next series. We will be starting a new youth group series next week, but this week we'll be doing a standalone message. And this week's standalone message is called, Don't Be a Lane 8 Christian. Do not be a Lane 8 Christian. Now, I'm a washed up former college athlete now, but one time back in the past, I used to run track and field. And if any of you guys have run track and field or you know a little bit about track and field, you know that the fastest lane on the track is lane eight, right? Or maybe even lane one, right? Lane eight or lane one, they're the fastest lanes on the track. Well, if you've actually ever run track and field, you know that that is not true. Actually, lane eight is one of the slowest lanes on the track, with lane one as well. I argue that lane eight is the slowest on the track because when you're running in lane eight, oftentimes you're running near a fence that is um, separating the track from the stands or the spectators who are watching the event. And oftentimes you're, you're running in lane eight and you can high-five your mom and your dad as you are coming in last place. Lane 8 is not the fastest lane on the track. In fact, lane 4 and lane 5 are the fastest lanes on the track. If you're one of the faster athletes, those are the lanes that you are going to be placed into, not lane 8. But when I ran track back in middle school, I had a friend who used to take pride in being slow. Whenever we do a warm-up lap around the track, or whenever we'd be stretching, jogging, what have you, instead of going in the fast lanes where the rest of the athletes would be warming up, he purposely would go out into lane eight, and he would bring other friends with him as well. And these friends were also not the fastest athletes in their own right. But they would warm up in lane eight because they thought it was funny to be slow. And they just were just there to have a good time. Again, this is middle school when most people just hang out in the pole vault pits and just want to flirt with girls and whatnot. But they're in lane eight, having a good old time, taking pride in being slow. Whereas they should have strove to be in lane three, four, or five, one of the fast lanes, so that they can be as good at track and field as possible. But here's the thing, beloved. Lane eight is still on the track, as is lane one. Now, lane eight's not going to win you a bunch of races. It's oftentimes going to come in last or second to last on the track. But it is still on the track, no matter how slow it is. Lane eight is still a part of the track. And the parallel that I would like to make between track and field and the Christian life is this. The Christian life is a race for fruitfulness. It's a race for fruitfulness. Now, what in the world is fruitfulness? Well, fruitfulness is living a good, godly, righteous life filled with good deeds. That's what it means to be a fruitful Christian. You're living a life that is defined by love for God and love for others. You're doing good works with the Holy Spirit's help. You're living out the grace that has been given to you in Christ. You're chasing after Jesus with all you've got. That's what it means to live a life that is chasing after fruitfulness. And that's ultimately what the Christian life is when it's all boiled down. We are zealous for good works. We are not lazy Christians just because we're saved by grace through faith. That does not mean that we don't go out and work our, our tails off chasing after Jesus. The Christian life is a race after fruitfulness and faithfulness to Jesus. And Jesus says this, he implies this in the parable of the soils. And if you know this story, I'm not going to read the whole story. I'm just going to read about the fourth soil here. And that correlates to us as Christians. 
we are the fourth soil, ultimately. The seed that has fallen on good soil, that has become receptive to the gospel, that bears fruit, that seeks to follow after God and to do good works, and to be zealous for the things of God. That is us here. We are the fourth soil, if you are in Christ. That is us. But what I want us to notice about the fourth soil is this. Matthew chapter 13, verse 23, says the following. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. That's us. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding now, this is where kind of my eyebrows popped up here upon reading this. That person yields a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. 160 or 30 times what was sown. Now, what, what I want us to notice about this text is that there are some late-eight Christians out there who might not be as equally fruitful as a lane four Christian. Now, a lane eight Christian is still a Christian. Do not get me wrong on that. They are still following the Lord. They are still chasing after God in, in some respect. But they're not quite on the level of a lane four or five or three Christian who bears a crop a hundredfold what was sown initially into it. And here's a picture of it. In lane four, you've got a hundredfold. Lane six, you've got 60-fold of what was sown initially. And then lane eight, you've got a crop that yields 30-fold of what was sown initially. And John MacArthur makes this comment about Christians and their fruitfulness when he says this, All Christians are fruitful, but not all Christians are equally fruitful. Not all Christians are equally fruitful. Some are in lane eight, or lane six, or lane four. All are Christians, but not all of them bear the same amount of good fruit. And we also have to clarify something um, very, very theologically <laughs> a non-negotiable, something that we must grasp and that we must understand before we even talk about bearing fruit for the Christian. That Christians, we as Christians, we do not get to heaven by our good works. We cannot earn our way into heaven or earn right standing with God through our good works. We only earn right standing with God, earn, if you will, through faith in Jesus, because Jesus has earned that right standing with God. Through faith in him, we are now part of his body. When he sees us, when God sees us, he sees Christ. He does not see our sin any longer. So we as Christians, we do not get to heaven by our good works. But here's the catch. We as Christians are rewarded in heaven by our good works. Our lives are assessed by our good works. And we get to celebrate the victories that we've won for Christ and the righteousness that we've fought for for Christ. We get to celebrate those things forever and ever and ever. But we have so few moments here on this earth to actually do that and to win those victories for Christ. So few moments. But we have all eternity to celebrate the good, righteous deeds that we do for Christ here on this earth in the short time span that he has placed us here. We are rewarded in heaven for our good works once we get there. All right? And Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or we are away from him. So, whether we're in heaven pleasing God because we are sinless people and we will no longer sin anymore, we're pleasing God in that the ultimate sense, we can never sin ever, ever again. We're going to be pleasing him in that regard for sure. But he says just as much as you want to please him and you seek to please him in the next life, seek to please him just as much in this life. Or we're going to be perfect in the next life. We can't help but do anything but please him in the next life. So try by God's grace, to please him just as much now as you will then. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying here in verse 9. He goes on to say this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. We will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Both Christian and non-Christian 
alike will both appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But we are not under his condemnation any longer. He judges us by the quality of our works after we've already been saved by him. Whereas the non-Christian, they have not been saved by him. And they are judged by all the bad things they do, and there is no grace for them whatsoever. We've already been saved. We've got nothing to lose any longer. We've got everything to gain. And that's the beauty of being a Christian. And Paul also says this in the first letter to the Corinthians. In this context, he's talking specifically about pastors and ministers who are teaching doctrine and theology that is not as sound as good, sound, hard, quality doctrine. And it will be shown for what it is on the last day. But this also applies to us as Christians as well. What kind of foundation are we building our lives on? What kind of doctrines are we living by? Because behind every practice in our life, behind every good work or bad work, there's a doctrine behind that. There's a theory behind that. There's a theology behind that, a belief in God behind that. What are we building our life on? Well, this is what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It's what Paul says. At the end of the day, when all of our last works and all of our good works and bad works and our lives are assessed at the judgment seat of Christ, it will happen like this. If what has been built, namely our good works, if what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. Yes, praise God. If your heart's uh, intent behind you completing such good works was to please God and to live for God and to live for Christ and not to live for yourself, you will receive a reward that will last forever where no moth and no rust and no thief can ever break in and steal or destroy any of these good works that you have done. You will receive a reward if your works are genuine. But if it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Only as one escaping through the flames. It's almost like you still got hot ash on you as you enter into the pearly gates. And I think that in one sense is referring to a lane eight type of Christian. Somebody who does not build their life on sound doctrine or live with sound intents and heart inclinations to go out and actually please Christ. I think, in part, that is what this text is referring to. All Christians are fruitful, but not all Christians are equally fruitful. A lot of good deeds that we thought that we have performed here in this life will be exposed for what it is in the next life. But the beauty about this passage is this, is that none of us will ever lose our salvation. Whether you're in lane four, or you're in lane eight. You are secure eternally in Christ Jesus. But we will appear before his judgment seat to receive the, the, the things that are due, for, due us while we are yet in our body. All right? So we should make it our aim and our goal to have sound hearts, intents, and inclinations, and desires to go out and to please God. And at the judgment seat of Christ, those deeds will be shown to be good for what they were while we were here in the body. Now, I have a quick question for you, based off of this. Why wouldn't you want to be in lane four? In light of this truth, in light of you being able to inherit treasure that will never perish in the next life. Moth and rust cannot destroy this. Thieves cannot break in and steal, and you'll get to celebrate the treasures and the wins that you have made for Christ for all of eternity. Now, why would you want to be stuck in lane eight? Why wouldn't you want to work your way to lane four? I got another quick question for you based off of that question. <clears throat> if you aren't striving to get to lane four, are you even on the track at all? Are you even on the track at all? There's no lane 12 out here. Some tracks have a lane nine or even a lane 10 at bigger track meets. But there's no lane 12 or 15 or 20. You're not in the grass here. That's what a non-believer is. That's a lane for a non-believer. They don't rejoice in the things of God. They don't seek to please God. All the good works that they do 
do not have a heart that is inclined towards God, and that will be shown and exposed for what it is on the day of wrath. But for us as Christians, we get to choose how fruitful we want to be. But if you're not even striving to get to lane four and to bear a bunch of fruit that will last forever and ever and ever, you need to ask yourself, am I even on the track whatsoever? Or can I care less about being fruitful for God and for his kingdom and seeing God's kingdom come here on earth and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, says this to that point. All who have this hope in Christ purify themselves, just as he is pure. Now this hope that the Apostle John is talking about here is the hope of of us getting to see Jesus Christ in glory someday. We get to see him and behold him and finally be fully like him just as he is because we finally get to see him face to face. And the reason that we are not perfectly pure and righteous and holy and blameless in one sense here in this life and why we still mess up and why we still sin in this life, it's because we have not yet seen Christ face to face. But the promise is, when we see Jesus in glory, in heaven, after this life, when we see him face to face, we will be like him as he is. That's the hope that John is talking about here. Anybody who has this hope purifies themselves. If you have the hope of seeing Jesus Christ in glory someday, you will want to work your way to lay in four. You will not want to stay satisfied with bearing only 30-fold crop in lane 8 or lane 9. By God's grace, by His Holy Spirit dwelling in you, you yearn to cooperate with Him so that you can purify yourself, so that all that excess dross can be burned to the surface in your life, and your deeds can be more and more genuine and more and more God-honoring than they were before. Everybody who has the right hope of seeing Jesus Christ one day in glory, you will work your way to lane four. You will purify yourself. Why? Because he is pure. And you yearn to be like him. And you want to bear as much fruit for him as humanly possible in your life, in the flesh, for however long God has you here. You will purify yourself. So if you could care less about purification whatsoever and all this just sounds completely foreign and alien to you, Ask yourself, wrestle with God, bring this to God tonight, even in a hot sweat in your bed tonight, if you have to. God, am I even on the track? In other words, those who have this hope in Christ, the hope that we will see him one day in glory, be like he is, those who have this hope in Christ, they run. They chase after God with all they've got. Even if it's uphill, if you have to run to go and see him in glory. Even if you have to run through valleys of the shadow of death to see Christ. And go through mountainous terrain to be able to do good works for others. To do good works for God. You will run at all costs if you have this hope in Christ. You will do whatever it takes. You will lose sleep at night thinking about the good deeds that you can do on behalf of thinking about how you can bear a crop, being zealous for good deeds, no matter what your family or friends who may even persecute you might think. You will run your tail off to see Jesus in his fullness if you have the proper hope in him. And the author of Hebrews draws this exact parallel between the Christian life and a track meet in Hebrews chapter 12 when he says this. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run. Let us run a marathon. The Christian life is a marathon, not a sprint. It's 26.2 miles, not 0.2 miles. That's what the other soils were in that parable. The first three soils didn't make it. They couldn't run the marathon. But that's not us. We run the marathon. 
And we run it with perseverance. We run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. That is the key to being able to run this race. The author and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of Almighty God. Now, consider him. Look at him. Contemplate him. Think about seeing him in glory one day and the purification that will finally be yours in its fullness. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners. So much uphill sprinting, if you will. So much persecution from non-believers and Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes that would one day kill him. Consider him who endured that sort of opposition so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So that you won't quit on him. So that you'll keep running the race with endurance while sweat drips down your brow until you see him in glory when he calls you from this earth. Consider him and run your tail off. Now a question that I have for you this evening is in light of our quarantine here due to the coronavirus, what has hindered your race towards Christ? during this quarantine. What has hindered your race? Assuming that you're running after him at all. What has hindered your race? Because it says we throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Of course you're going to want to throw off the sin that easily entangles. You know not to sin. You know not to lust. You know not to steal. You know not to lie. You know those things. But are you willing to throw off the things that hinder you? The dumbbells in your arms, if you will, as you run the race for Christ. Or the ankle weights on your legs as you run after Christ. It's like you're trying to run a Christian marathon. You're trying to run, let's say, a literal marathon. And before you go to bed every single night, you down four Twinkies. Every single night, you eat four of them. Is that helping anything? Is that helping you run your marathon better? You and I both know the answer that it's not. But yet in the Christian walk, we so oftentimes eat spiritual Twinkies or hold spiritual dumbbells in our hands that aren't spiritual at all. They hinder us. Even Satan uses them as instruments to hold us back from running our race as fast as we can, from being as fruitful as we possibly can. What is hindering you? Is it TikTok, Instagram? Your phone, whatever it is, maybe you're not even getting out of the blocks to run the race for Christ. What has hindered you from running wholeheartedly after him? Pray that God would reveal such things to you, and he will. The Holy Spirit will bring that conviction in your heart that you should change, and that he will rise, that dross to the top. He will purge you, he will sanctify you, he will purify you as he is pure. He never punishes us. He only purifies us to make us better, to make us better men and women, more fruitful men and women who chase after his own heart. Pray that God would help you see these things, and he will. I'd like to close with one scripture here that really floored me in light of our present quarantine from the book of Job. I was reading this in my devotions the other day, and I wanted to share and close with this. Job chapter 37, verses 6 or 7 says this. God does great things beyond our understanding. Amen. We can't understand him sometimes because he's so great. He says to the snow, fall on the earth, and to the rain shower, be a mighty downpour. He controls nature. He ordains snowfall. He ordains a downpour. And he ordains the coronavirus. God is ultimately in control of everything. And that's what is being said here in this text. He says, fall on the earth to the snow, to the rain shower, be a mighty downpour. Now, why does he say these things to nature? Why does he send snow? Why does he send a downpour? And why does he even send a coronavirus? Well, here's one of the reasons that he does. So that everyone he has made may know his work. He stops 
all people from their labor. And if you're like the rest of the country right now, your labor has either been thwarted or completely stopped. And you're now placed into a season of active waiting to see what happens next. And you finally realize that you're not as in control as you once thought that you were. He makes everyone know his work by stopping them from working. And as you've been stopped from working, perhaps, as you were once able to before the coronavirus, how have you responded? How have you reflected upon God and the things of God? Have you asked God, God, show me more of yourself. I want to see you. I yearn to be like you. I yearn to reflect on your works right now and acknowledge that you're sovereign and you're God and I'm neither. Have you stopped to do that? Because one of the reasons that God sends such things as the coronavirus or even a snowstorm or a rainstorm that stops people from working is he wants us to reflect on him to acknowledge his works and his sovereignty and his providence and his goodness and his wisdom and the fact that he is so wholly other than any of us. He wants us to stop and to reflect on such things. So may we take time to do that in the coming days, weeks, months, however long this lasts. But let's not waste our quarantine by Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, whatever, and we could care less about purification and the things of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for today and for these youth students. And God, you're doing a million things at once. You send a coronavirus so that we can reflect on you, so that we can chase after you more wholeheartedly. You also bring judgment through the coronavirus. God, may we repent if we haven't already. If we're not on the track running after you with our whole hearts, may you get us on the track and may you grant our repentance, Jesus. May we chase after you with our whole hearts. May we work our way to lane four. May we be as fruitful of believers in you as we possibly can. And it's only by your help and by your spirit that we are able to accomplish such things. So God, may you help us. It is only by your grace that we are able to do anything. So send your spirit now, we pray. And it's in your son's precious name that we do pray.